So this is the season for giving and receiving gifts, yeah? And, and so if you plan to give any gifts or receive any gifts or you, maybe you have some holiday shopping to do, I've done some online research for you. I wanted to find out what are the hottest gifts this year. So just maybe this will save you some time. And so if you are shopping particularly for kids, I did some research, talked to some kids about what's hot this year. Pie face game, can't go wrong there. Get a pie in the face, right? Or this, I don't know what it is, but apparently it's a popular, the new Furby Connect. Anybody know about this? I mean, I don't have kids that age. No? Okay. All right. Or, or anything that's a Nerf and a gun together, and you have a boy in your house, it's going to work well. The more powerful, the better. This is like the Nerfinator like 2.0 or something like that. And I could just imagine some of our little boys running around with one of those things. Um, but what about if you're looking for something for an adult in your life? Um, always popular are the, the fitness trackers, right? Nothing says I love you like get up off the couch and burn some calories already, right? <laughs> so if any of you men bought these for your wife without her explicitly asking for it, I want to caution you. You know your wife better than me, but I would rethink that whole thing. And the good thing is you got two weeks left to... Uh, Take that back. Very popular this year also are like v, v, virtual reality um, sets. Who, how can you live without a drone, right? Everyone needs a drone to be able to like fly around and take pictures. We need that aerial view of our house to post on Facebook, don't we? Or uh, the, the new um, personal assistants, the digital assistants are popular, like the Amazon Echo, where you just talk to Alexa and ask her any question, and she will give you a ready answer for any question. And then if we're not already there, for the category in the category of for people who have everything, I, mean, I think this is all for people who have everything, but you might want to consider the levitating Bluetooth speaker. You can have that for under $100. Or Co is it Cosmo, yeah, Cosmo the toy robot, that's about $200. I guess that's a pretty hot seller. Or who can't do without a toothpaste tube roller? Those are $25. Or I love this one. This is the paper towel holder, but it's also got the USB ports so you could charge your devices. We don't have enough ports to charge our devices, and this holds paper towels. <laughs> so how do we live without that? I don't know. But before you ask for any gifts or buy any gifts, I think it's good for us to stop and consider the question that Sam kind of led us into this morning. What makes a good gift? What makes a, a gift meaningful? What makes a gift meaningful for you? Because we're all kind of different in this regard. Maybe you're the kind of person where it's the thought that counts, right? That you want to see a gift given to you that shows that somebody really knows who you are and what you value, right? Or for some of us, maybe we like more of the homemade gifts because we want to see that somebody's put some effort into it and they've worked to create this gift. Others of us, we may not admit this, but maybe for us, the more money that's spent on the gift, the more meaningful it is. Or if you're like my wife, the better deal I get, the more meaningful the gift is. And so if I get a really screaming deal on something that she's going to like, then I'm in good, and that gift I know is going to be meaningful to her. What makes a gift meaningful to you? Well, today we're continuing our series, Advent Conspiracy, and we've been asking this question all through the Advent season, can, can Christmas still change the world? And specifically, can the way we celebrate Christmas still change the world the way it did 2,000 years ago. You know, 2,000 years ago, God left heaven to become one of us, to put on flesh, to become a baby, born in a barn to a teenage girl. Can the idea of God coming as one of us to rescue us from our sins still be the center of our celebration of this holiday 2,000 years later? And so far, we've seen in this conspiracy that if we want to really enter into it, we've got to do four things. And the first thing we looked at was we need to be willing to worship fully. That Christmas is all about worship. I mean, think about the mystery of the incarnation. God putting on human flesh. God coming as a baby. God becoming one of us. It's this profound mystery. It's hard to wrap our minds around. And at the time of the year when we celebrate the incarnation that we should be slowing down as much as possible to just kind of try to take this mystery in. It seems we do the opposite. And we actually try to cram more activity into our time than any other period of the year. But if we're going to worship fully at this time of year, we need to be willing to create space in our lives. And one of the ways we create space in our lives is what we talked about last week, and that's spending less. That we need to be willing to not buy into the religion of hyper-consumerism that promises things that really things can't give, right? Stuff 
cannot give me eternal joy or eternal life. Stuff cannot give me my sense of identity. Stuff cannot save me. Remember, Caesar isn't Lord. Stuff isn't Lord. Jesus is Lord. And so last week we talked about a few ways of applying this principle of spending less. And we had three levels, remember? So if you're here with us, you know that level one was just buy one less gift this year. Right? Just one less gift. And you decide who that's for, and hopefully it's going to be a mutual thing. But just one less gift, save a little bit of money. Or level two, buy one less gift and, and just say, I'm not going to buy any gifts out of obligation. I'm just putting my foot down. I'm not going to do it. That's not celebrating the season of Christmas, giving out of obligation. I'm not going to do it. Or number three, what if we were to give away half of our Christmas budget? So that can mean maybe you normally spend $1,000 on Christmas. You're only going to spend $500. You give $500 away. Or for those, some of you would say, I normally spend $1,000 on Christmas. I'm just going to double it. I'm going to give $1,000 away so that Jesus kind of gets as much as, at least as what I'm giving other people on his birthday. But if you remember, we discussed what possibilities, what might happen if we were to spend less and bring the money that we saved together and pooled it together as a community. What kind of issues around the world could we target? What communities could we transform? What lives could we transform? And we began to kind of dream about that. This is something that we've been doing for several years. Just consider what we might do. As Americans, this year we're estimated to spend $465 billion for Christmas. That's a number we can't wrap our mind around. That's just a lot of money, $465 million. If we, as Americans, just took 13% of that and gave it away, we would eliminate extreme poverty on the planet. I mean, just think about that. $60 billion a year, it's estimated, would eliminate extreme poverty on the planet. But maybe 13% is too much. So what if we just took 2% of what we spend on Christmas as Americans and gave it away? $10 billion would solve the, the clean water crisis on our planet and give clean drinking water to every person on the planet. So you can start to see, wow, if we really enter into this conspiracy and all the American people and at least the Christians got on board with this, we could do a world of good. What might happen? We just dream. Now, that's what we're doing this year. We're going we're gonna to do this again every year. We, we take a Christmas offering. and So the question is, what are we giving it to? What issues are we addressing? I'd like to tell you briefly, but first of all, let me tell you why we're not addressing the clean water crisis. This is what a lot of Advent Conspiracy churches do. They address clean water. We've done it in the past during Christmas. We've addressed clean water. So why not this year? Well, because of our work with Team World Vision the last two years, did you know that Team World Vision Colorado, of which New Day was a part, we have completely funded every water project in the country of Rwanda for the next year. That's where we've been focusing our time. I mean, it's like, that's pretty crazy. Now, we've been a part of that. So, I mean, we've been focused on Rwanda. They said, we got a $200,000 budget. This is what we need to do to bring clean drinking water over the next year to all these communities. And we're, okay, there's $200,000. We, we just, Team World Vision just did that in Colorado. And I got to tell you how satisfying that is because it was just earlier this year, was it in March? Uh, I was with a group of you, 10 or 12. We were in Rwanda and we were standing on the top of this hill. And there was this village at the top of this hill. And we had worked hard to get to this village. We walked a long way. And we, we came to this valley. And there was this muddy creek running through this valley. And there was a bridge across it. We walked across the bridge, across this muddy creek. And we climbed this really steep, I don't know, it's more than a hill, but it's less than a mountain. I don't know what that is, but it's a big, big hill. And we get to the top, and there's this village with about 800 people living in this village. And they heard we were coming, so they all gathered together because they wanted to tell their stories and what Team World Vision and what World Vision had done to bring clean water to their community. And they began to tell stories about how up until just the last six months, for as long as they had been there, they had to walk to the bottom of that big hill, go to that muddy creek, gather the water, carry it all the way back up the hill for everything, for washing, for, for drinking, for cooking. That was where all their water came from. But then because of what Team World Vision had done, the, they, they now have three clean water points up there at the top of this hill. And so they began to tell how that changed their lives, how they're not getting sick from the water anymore, how now they have hours a day that they can now focus on work, farming, homework for the kids, going to school. And as they're telling these stories, they began to sing. And then they began to dance. And then pretty soon the whole village is just singing and dancing. And the translators are there, and they're telling us what they're singing. And they're just basically singing, thank you. Thank you, God, for bringing these people who would care enough to bring water to our village. Thank you for the transformation it's brought in our lives. And we're just, so then we started dancing, and then we're singing, and it's awesome. So that's why we're not doing anything about water for Christmas. So what are we doing? 
Let me just tell you very quickly what we're going to do with our Christmas offering. Number one, we are going to provide for the poor in our own community. I know that word poor is not politically correct. I'm just using biblical language. Uh, there are poor in our community, as we just heard in this woman's story, and we want to do what we can to partner with Parker Task Force to provide for the poor in our community. Number two, we want to help build a church and a home in Iquitos, Peru. We want to uh, provide for Syrian refugees and those fleeing Mosul, Iraq. Right now, there are people losing their lives, losing their homes, losing family members because of war in the Middle East. They desperately need help. We want to partner with organizations who are bringing that. And then finally, we want to fund several rescue and recovery operations for those held in slavery by human traffickers. I hope you'll be with us next week because we're really going to dig into these four issues. I'm going to be sharing stories, showing some videos so that we can really get a sense of where this offering is going to go. But again, I just want to say every penny that's given to this Christmas offering passes out of our hands and into the hands of those who need it most. And so let me just encourage you to give generously. Spend less and give generously this Christmas. Typically, we would give that offering at the Christmas offering, but if you can't be there, you can give any time through the month of December. Just mark Christmas offering. Go online to our website. You can give there. But again, I want to encourage you to give generously because, as I mentioned last week, for the first time ever, we have a matching donor who's going to be matching whatever we give in the month of December to the Christmas offering up to $40,000. And so when we get to December 31, we're going to look at what we've got. Is it 20000 25000 30000 40000 That's going to be matched dollar for dollar. I mean, where else can you double your money immediately, double your impact immediately? And in, in issues like this, it's going to go a long way. So let me just encourage you to dream about what we could do together by spending less. But more than just spending less, we need to be willing to also give more. You're like, well, wait, wait a minute. That seems like a contradiction. How can I spend less and give more? Because if I'm going to give more, I've got to spend more, right? But when we talk about giving more, we're talking about giving a different kind of gift altogether. Maybe not the kind of gift that we're used to giving. And as we study and look at the gift that Jesus gave us at Christmas, we could see the kind of gift that he gave, and we can learn from him. And as we learn from him, we start to see how we can make our celebration of Christmas even more meaningful by following his example. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app and you want to find Matthew chapter 1, we're going to be looking at Matthew 1, 18 through 23. We're going to look at this familiar Christmas story. You've probably heard this part of the story before, maybe not, but whether you've heard it or not, I just want to encourage you to enter into the story with fresh eyes, to see the miracles that are actually happening, that actually took place with fresh lens, and, and just to be able to experience the wonder of this story fresh and new this morning. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child. Okay, so far, everything's normal, right? No miracles yet. Through the Holy Spirit. Okay, story's all of a sudden taking a strange turn here. She is pregnant with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Okay, again, normal story there. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. What an amazing story. I mean, if you just step back and just look at it, again, it seems like a normal story. This guy and this girl, they're betrothed to be married, but before they get married, you know, and live a life that's just going to be like every other couple that just kind of fades into memory. Nobody knows anything about them. She gets pregnant through the Holy Spirit. God visits her and says, you're going to be the mother of God's son. And, and Joseph, he doesn't really believe that story. But then an angel comes to him and speaks to him in vision and tells him not only that this is true, but what to name the child, Jesus, for he will save his people from the sins, his sins. And, and as Matthew's telling this remarkable story, he kind of stops it right here in verse 22 and 23, and he gives this parenthetical statement in the middle of the story to say, oh, and by the way, this thing that's happening has been prophesied hundreds of years ago. He, he's kind of drawing attention to the Jewish reader in particular, uh, to the prophet Isaiah, who wrote back in like 600 B.C. 
This thing that Matthew includes in his story, that the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. That is a quote from a 600-year-old prophecy. And then Matthew even goes on to say what Emmanuel means. It means God with us. This was the promise. And so Matthew, in the telling of his story, kind of takes a time out and says, oh, and by the way, that thing that's been promised to us for hundreds of years, that God would come and be with us, be one of us, that he would move into our neighborhood, that he would come and walk among us. Well, that's what's happening. That's what's happening right now. Jesus is moving into our neighborhood. He's become one of us. And this is a truly amazing event that we've since come to call the incarnation, which is this theological term that just simply means God in the flesh. That God has come to be with us. We have to ask the question, why? Why would God give up so much? Why would he take such a giant step down? Why would he become a baby? The, The first and most obvious answer is because he loves us tremendously. That he loves us so much that he would be one of us. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only son. And that love drove him to give us that first Christmas exactly what we needed, right? No dog food in the brownies. It was just exactly what he, we needed, that he loved us. He looked into our circumstances, and he saw because of our rebellion, because of our sin, that we had kind of kicked God out of his own creation, that we had separated ourselves from the source of life. And as, as a result of our sin and as a result of our rebellion, that all of us, every person who was ever, ever born, every person you've ever locked eyes with, every person in this room and who's ever lived, was heading toward an eternal oblivion, separated from the God who loves them and created them and wanted to give them life. God looked into our situation And he saw what we needed, and he went to Best Buy and bought us the latest activity tracker. Thankfully, that's not the Christmas story, right? God gave us so much more than stuff, right? The Father saw our deep need, and so he gave us his one and only Son. So that whoever has faith in him, whoever believes in him, will not separate that eternity separated from him, but would be with him forever. God's answer for the world's problem has never been stuff. God did not give us more stuff. He gave us himself. So the first thing Jesus gave us at Christmas is he gave us his presence, right? He is Emmanuel, God with us. And if we want to find meaning during Advent, we have to be willing to give more, more than just stuff. We need to be willing to give ourselves. You know, our world, we, I think we all know it, it's increasingly fractured and isolated. People feel lonely. People feel disconnected, which leads to all other kinds of emotions. We need to be with one another. We need to be in relationship with one another. And at Christmas time, it's important to give gifts that are more about our presence than it is about the presence. Right? You get what I'm saying there? So, again, I'm not saying that we don't buy gifts for one another. I'm not saying that we don't wrap the, 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 the gift and put it under the tree. But what if this Christmas we focused on giving more, that we gave gifts that were more relational in nature versus gifts that isolate us? You know, if you think about it, some gifts just by nature are very isolating. We, I, let me use the example of an iPad. Right? I got nothing against iPads. I own an iPad. I love my iPad. iPads are valuable. But iPads, by their very nature, are isolating. Right? I give you an iPad, and for most of the applications of it, I'm going to go into my own little world, and I'm going to just be right here in isolation by myself. Certainly, I can connect to other people through it, but for most applications, that's where I'm going to be. But what if we began to think about our gift giving in terms of how will this build or how can this build relationship with the person that I love who I'm giving the gift to? So anything that builds relationship would be valuable. So think about an example of a a baseball mitt. A baseball mitt isn't something I could use on my own, right? It needs to be two people that own a baseball mitt. So what if a a dad for Christmas bought his son a baseball mitt and said, okay, now I've got my baseball mitt, you've got your baseball mitt, we're going to build relationship by throwing the ball together. It's a relational gift. Or think about something like, uh, table games. Table games are also very relational in nature. Most games you can't play by yourself. You've got to play them with other people. They're, they're relational. It's a great relational gift. Or what if you were to give your spouse the gift of a book, something that could be isolating, but it's a, a book on marriage or relationship or intimacy or something like that, and you say, you know what? 
once a week for an hour. We're going to have a date on the couch. We're going to read this book out loud together. We're going to build relationship through this book. Or what if you were to buy a special kind of tea and give a box of tea to one of your best friends and say, you can only drink this tea when you're with me. That this year we are going to spend time together building relationship, drinking tea. I think of, of times um, that we've bought relational gifts for our family, for our boys. I think of the time that we bought a foosball table and a ping pong table. Those aren't, get, aren't, aren't things you can play on your own. They, they get us around the table. They get us relating to one another. Or even gifts that might otherwise isolate, if given the right way, can really build relationship. So for, for the, you, know, you can still buy the Queen Barbie Castle and Cook set. But you just tell your daughter, hey, we're going to put this together, together. We're going to assemble it together. We're going to play with it together. And we're going to bond over this game. Or I think of the time that I gave one of my sponsored children in Rwanda the gift of a coloring book and crayon, something that could be seen as isolating but I'll never forget the warm fuzzies I felt as she kind of snuggled up under my arm and for like three hours she colored this picture on my lap and we just kind of spent that time bonding together. The best gift ever given, ever received at Christmas was a relational gift. It was Jesus. He gave himself. He gave his presence. He, he became Emmanuel, God with us. And we would do well to, to learn from that example and say, how can I give a gift that is relational in nature to those we love. Second, Jesus also gave a, a personal gift. Um, he clearly thought about me. He thought about you before he gave the gift that he gave at Christmas. And he gave us exactly what we needed. Right? Verse 21 in the story we just read said that his name should be Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Jesus looked at us and said, I know what they need. <laughs> they need forgiveness. They need reconciliation. They need adoption into my father's family. They need salvation, eternal life. And Jesus said, because that's exactly what they need, because I know them so well, that's what I'm going to give them. And it wasn't like an afterthought. It wasn't something he just threw together. Because Re Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 tells us that Jesus was a lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. And so this isn't a gift that he just thought up really quick and kind of threw into a bag and kind of gave to us. But there's forethought that went into this. The New Testament makes it clear that before God created the world, he predestined that he was going to give Jesus as a gift because that's exactly what we would need, a sin bearer, a savior. And so the gift of Jesus was tailor-made to fit our needs. And so how do we give personal gifts at this time of year? How do we think about the person we're giving to and what they might like and what they might need rather than an impersonal gift? Because we all probably know what it's like to, to receive the impersonal gift. You go to the office party, you get the fruitcake. Or, you know, you get Uncle Mert's, like, used, clearly used sweater. Like, you know it's been used because you saw him wearing it last Christmas. I mean, you know, just insert your own awkward example. But we know what it's like. But we've also given gifts like that, right? We've all had the person show up to the holiday gathering that we weren't expecting. And so we go rooting around in our closet. We're looking for something, and we, we get the best of REO Speedwagon CD, and we, like, wrap it up. And here, this is for you. I mean, we all know what it's like to receive and, and to give impersonal gifts that just not only are a waste of money in many places, in cases, but also just scream. I've given no thought whatsoever to this gift, but I just felt obligated to give you something, right? Nothing says love. Nothing says Let's celebrate the birth of Jesus like a gift like that. But relational giving means that we pay attention to the other person. We think about what's important to them and what they might like or what they need. I have Some of the most significant gifts have been like some of those picture books that people make, those hardcover picture books. Uh, I remember coming back from Africa uh, on a trip, and, and a friend of mine made uh, one of those hardcover books with all these pictures from our trip in it with narration all through it. Or I went on a, a two-week family trip and a family member made one of those books. That's a book that just says, I thought about you. I put some time into this. That's a, a, that's a gift that's not going to end up in a garage sale. It's not going to end up in a box in the garage. It's not going to be regifted, certainly, right? It, it's personal. I heard the story of a father who was celebrating Christmas with his daughter, who was a senior in high school, and he realized this is our last Christmas before she goes off to college. And many of you know what that's like. Many of you have been there. And so he thought about what is it that could be a meaningful gift to her. And so he bought two journals and he wrapped them. And he gave one to her, and, he, and one was for him. He said, let's both write in these journals all throughout the year. 
We'll write about things that we're experiencing that the other isn't experiencing because we're apart. We'll write about the emotions that we're feeling being apart and what that adjustment is like. And then next Christmas, we'll give each other the gift of that journal. That is a significant gift. It's personal. What would you make for somebody that you love to communicate the fact that you love them? What words would you write down to express to a friend how you feel about them that would be meaningful to them? How could you give a gift that you know a friend or family member would be passionate about? You know, maybe the person you're giving to doesn't need more stuff, but they're a person who really wants to make a difference in the world. Why not consider giving a gift out of like the ADRA gift catalog or the World Vision gift catalog? You give a, a goat to a family in Burundi or you give a cow to a family in India and then you give it in their name and they get a card saying, hey, a family in India received a cow in your name because of this person. I, I've received gifts like that and they're meaningful because that tells me that the person giving the gift is in tune with what's important to me. But Jesus, he considered who we were, considered what we needed, and he gave exactly what we needed, salvation. How can we give personal gifts this year? Finally, we want to give more by giving a gift that costs us something. You, you think about Jesus' gift, we know it cost him something. I mean, the Bible makes it real clear that, that Jesus leaving heaven was a huge sacrifice, right? The throne of the universe, the worship of every created being, stepping out of that and into an embryo. I mean, that's a sacrifice. But more than that, he had to take a great risk to come. He had to risk being rejected. He had to risk being hurt. And he was both rejected and he was hurt. He was killed for our sake. It cost him something. And in the same way, relational gifts, if we want to give more, we need to give gifts that maybe cost us something. They cost us time. They cost us energy. You know, it's much easier to run down to the mall or get onto Amazon or go down to the gas station and just pick up something and just kind of give it. Oh, yeah, they'll, they'll like that. But when we start talking about the gift of presence and the personal gift, it starts kind of creating anxiety in us because it's going to take some creativity. It's going to take some energy. It's going to take some time. And more than that, it's going to be a risk. Because what if the person I give the gift to doesn't see all the time and energy I put into that? Or what if they misunderstand the gift that I'm giving them and, and, and just think, like, I'm a cheapskate or something, right? I give them the goat for the family in Burundi, and they're like, what's this? What, are you a cheapskate or something? You don't want to get me a real gift? I mean, we run the risk of being misunderstood. We run the risk of being rejected when we give gifts like these. It takes time. It takes energy. But these are all things that were inherent in the, the incarnation of Jesus. It took him time. It took him energy. And it was a great risk, a risk of being rejected and a risk of being misunderstood. And so when we go to that place, we're in really good company. So where do we start? Well, again, unfortunately, we're not alone in this journey, but we get to lean into each other. Um, we've got our Facebook page, New Day Network Facebook page. It would be great if we could start sharing some ideas of relational gifts. We could talk about this in our small groups. You could talk to your friends. What are you doing? Or I've got this person. I'm fortunate to have friends who their love language is gifts, and they're really good, and I'll often go to them and say, hey, I've got this person. This is what's important to them. What's a great gift? Or you can go to sites like reimagine or RethinkingChristmas.com. This is a great site if you're looking for a relational, personal gift because it's going to take you to a Pinterest site that has all of these ideas that people are doing that will spark something in your mind that may be appropriate for the person that you're giving to. Or just watch this video and maybe it'll kind of get your creative juices flowing. Dear friends and family, I don't think I can do Christmas this year. And mom, I know what you're gonna say. Don't be so dramatic, but I'm serious. I love parts of it, don't get me wrong. The family dinner, Ben's famous eggnog, grandma's oatmeal cookies, Tim's Christmas sweater hugs. But that's not what's getting to me. It's the 10 days till Christmas pressure, the never ending to-do list, the traffic jams, the credit card debt, all for what? To get that right gift to give meaning to it all? We spend so much money every year on good things for each other, but also on a lot of things just for things sake. Like that random gift card for you, Tracy, because I never know what you want. Or Cousin Joel, that shirt I know you didn't really like, that wasn't your size, which made you go back to the mall and waste that whole day just so you could receive a gift from me. And it's not that gifts are bad, but lately I don't understand how all the buying and busyness has anything to do with celebrating Christmas.
there were shepherds. And an angel appeared and said, Be not afraid. I bring you good news. A baby has been born. His name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. When did I forget what this has always been about? Maybe Christmas doesn't need to be different, but I need to be different. So here's what I'm going to do. The wife and I sat down. We decided to spend less anxiety, energy, and money, and instead give more relationally, like how God gave his son. Some of you we see all the time, so we thought about the gifts that could make that time more meaningful together. Others of you we don't see as often, so we wanted to make something with a bit of heart. We tried lots of things, and then we found out from a friend that you can roast your own coffee beans with a popcorn popper. So our family is making gifts with some personal notes and prayers. If the love of Jesus changed the world, what if, in celebration of that, we took a portion of what we used to spend on gifts for each other and instead gave a lasting gift to those in need? I know what you're thinking. Where do you even start? Well, how about here? Did you know that every minute a child dies from a water-related disease? What if we could give someone the gift of clean drinking water? I know, alone, our small gift doesn't seem huge. But the story of Christmas is that we're not alone. And if we all gave together, all of a sudden it's not so small anymore. And that's a Christmas story that I'd like to be a part of, and one we would all remember. So dear friends and family, who's ready for that Christmas? I know we are, and we're inviting you to join us. The good news is this, Jesus came, that a door was open from heaven to earth and he stepped through it and he became one of us. He came to be with us as Emmanuel, God with us. And he gave us exactly what we needed. He gave us forgiveness, reconciliation, adoption, salvation, eternal life. And he did it in a way that cost him something, cost him deeply. And so the question is, now that we have this hope, how can we celebrate this amazing act, this historical act, in a way that reflects what God gave us originally? How can we give the gift of our presence? How can we give a gift that's personal? How can we give in a way that is sacrificial? How can we together, how will you this year give in a way that can still change the world? Our Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus a gift that is beyond our comprehension to wrap our minds around, a gift so good, a gift that will keep giving into all eternity. May we, Father, as we celebrate this holiday, this great gift this month, may we celebrate it appropriately in ways that reflect the very reason why he came, to release the oppressed, to set the captive free, to give food to the hungry, to proclaim the good news to those who most need to hear it. Thank you, Father, that we get to do it together. In Jesus' name, amen.